بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم آمين. جزاكم الله خير everybody for coming really appreciate it. Um, you know inshallah that the idea of the event is to start uh, briefly with some uh, sort of historical context and some education around you know what's happening right now uh, with our brothers and sisters in Gaza. Um, that's not the main goal of the talk. Uh, the main goal is to help us to figure out, you know, in all of our different uh, contexts that we uh, exist at work, uh, in the different public spaces that we occupy, you know, how can we, um, you know, speak up for justice and speak up for our brothers and sisters uh, in Palestine. And then also to discuss a little bit about, um, you know, the spiritual uh, di dimension of this because it's it's related to all of those our ability to speak up in those spaces is related to our spiritual state um, And is related to you know our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's going to be a critical uh, aspect of it as well um, And I would also you know just remind everyone alhamdulillah we have Dr. Hatim Bazian who's coming on uh, Monday this Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, and he's a you know worldwide expert on this topic who's been uh, researching it and writing uh, and speaking on this topic for a very long time, so I feel really honored to, to have him come to the to this masjid, alhamdulillah, and I'm really looking forward to attending that event as well and hope to see as many of you there as, as possible. Um, uh, I should say I'm joined by uh, Sidi Shahrayar, uh, who's uh, been you know kind enough to, to support as well and to, and to he's not give us some of his experience uh, also working in the professional environment and in, in tech uh, and give us you know some uh, advice about how we can all uh, sort of do our best to uh, advocate for justice. And uh, Brother Osama Ahmed is a board member of American Muslims for Palestine. Uh, he has a lot of experience with uh, Palestine activism and is Palestinian himself. Uh, so I'll turn it over to him for the historical context aspect. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, Jazakallah khair, Brother Asad then for the uh, MCC for uh, putting on this event. Um, I'm originally f uh, Palestinian, I was born and raised in uh, Santa Clara. So I always love to actually come up here in this area, Pleasanton Masjid, and uh, I like to see the beautiful community and the amazing work that everyone does here. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and give you all uh, success. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to start you know, talking about this and when the recent events happened in October 7th, I think the first approach by a lot of Palestinians were to uh, highlight a lot of the injustices that are happening to our brothers and sisters in Gaza. And rightfully so, people took to the streets, people uh, wrote to their members of Congress, people were outspoken in their companies in the places that they work. And then naturally as humans, you always question why is this happening? And you feel depressed is probably the best way to explain it. And there's anger as well, which is justified. So in the past couple of days, I started to think about what are the best ways to relate my experiences as a Palestinian, what my parents went through, what especially my grandparents went through because they actually experienced the Nakba in 1948, which will be explained in this video. And I started to just be a little bit overwhelmed in the past couple of days emotionally. Um, and I started to realize that maybe the best thing to do is to just actually share what it means to be a Palestinian. And there's nothing better than sharing your personal narrative so that people can be empathetic and understand what Palestinians go through and what Palestinians do in order to resist this illegal occupation and what it actually means to be ethnically cleansed. So my parents were, uh, my grandparents my, from my father's side, they're from a village called Anaba, which is near Al-Lid, which is present day uh, Tel Aviv. They were uh, the biggest uh, ethnic cleansing that happened was actually in my grandparents' village. They were they were the first people to be kicked out in 1948. 
my grandfather and my grandmother uh, lived in the West Bank, which is uh, about 20 miles to the east of where they grew up and where they were born for two years. And then they were told that you have to then transport again and migrate to Jordan. So in 1952, they were in Jordan. And then my, grand, my uh, father was born a couple of years after that. He was raised in a refugee camp which is the, actually one of the largest refugee camps in Jordan, which houses around 60,000 Palestinians present day. Uh, so I think for people to just understand where we kind of come from, the, op the lack of opportunities in that refugee camp and how a lot of Palestinians, their main goal was to just survive. They went from owning a lot of land, farmers, merchants, you know, just working day-to-day -day jobs to now owning nothing and now trying to just figure out how to get by with UN subsidies, with, you know, uh, families of, let's say, like, you know, 15 people living in a room that's like 15 by 15 feet with just, you know, barely anything to just get by, going to UN schools and just trying to make a couple of, you know, dollars here and there. My mother's family, similar story. My mother was born in Jerusalem. Her family's been there for hundreds of years. And... They were kicked out in 1967, and she was uh, she was about five six years old, and she grew up in a southern city called Al Karak, which is famous for the castle of uh, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. And she grew up there, high school, and then she went to University of Jordan, and then my parents met and they moved here in the in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. The reason why I say this story is because if you meet any Palestinian, they will tell you, you know, if you meet any Palestinian that's my age, they will tell you where their father's from, what village their mother's from, who's married to who, how are, how are these two people related, you know, like Arabs, the Ansab, the lineage is very important to us. But for Palestinians, because we've been kicked out, it's more important because it's the only way for us to maintain connection. Uh, my grandparents were never allowed back. My father was not, it has never been back to his village. My mother only visited once. I have a lot of relatives in Jordan who are not allowed to visit. And uh, growing up, I was always told that the two things that are important are your deen and Palestine. And there's no question of whether or not we're going to go back one day to the villages, to the cities that we were once kicked out from. So I just want to give, you know, a kind of a personal story to that. Uh, in 2017, that was the first time I was, I was able to visit Palestine. And it was probably one of the most emotional moments in my life where I got to see uh, children who were brutally uh, tortured. I met mothers who lost their sons. I met uh, fathers who lost their kids, their daughters, and I met a lot of older people and visited a lot of villages that were, are just ruins right now due to the ethnic cleansing. And Assad, who we actually met in college, uh, and uh, you know, we became very close in college, and then after that we maintained communication. You know, he asked me to come here and to speak about kind of this Palestine 101. So I, as I was preparing, I actually stumbled on this video from Vox and at first I was kind of skeptical because there's obviously a narrative out there that wants to talk about how, you know, there was no ethnic cleansing. But when I watched the video, I was actually very impressed. So I felt that the best way to actually share a Palestine 101 or just give a primer to what's happening, because I know a lot of people have questions like Gaza and what's happening and like, why is Gaza here and West Bank's over there and like, you know, what's going on. And so just to kind of sum up, sum that up and then we can move on to like kind of more current. Uh, I felt that it would be really cool if you can watch this video. It is 16 minutes, so bear with me, but I think it's a really good, it's an excellent video. My village is a very beautiful one. It has a mountain full of trees of figs and grapes. <laughs> and it faces the main road to Jerusalem. This is a story about what happened here in 1948. There were only 750 people, and everybody knows each other. I came from a big family. We lived a good life. We never expected to be a massacred. It was a black spot in the history. 
that history has been carefully concealed, purposefully distorted, and in the West, largely forgotten. They put our village as an example of what they can do. The massacre in this village was one of many in a series of catastrophic events that became known as the Nakba, when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were violently displaced from their homeland in order to create the state of Israel. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. The borders of Palestine have been changed forcefully over time. But historically, this region has been home to Palestinians for centuries, with hundreds of villages and thriving cities. One of them being the central city of Jerusalem, with holy sites important to Jewish, Christian, and Muslim people. By the late Ottoman Empire, Palestinians living here were overwhelmingly Muslim, with minority Christian and Jewish native populations too. But regardless of religion, Palestinians were often referred to as Arabs, people of the Arabic-speaking world, despite their distinctive culture. Palestinians have long distinguished themselves as Ahl Palestine, or the people of Palestine. They developed a distinctive Arabic accent, they developed regional food, regional dress, and family ties. But by the time World War I began, several key political forces were competing for control of these lands. First, there was a growing Arab political movement, looking for independence from the Ottoman Empire in hopes of a unified Arab state that would include Palestine. Then there were Zionists, a political group that had one main goal, the creation of a Jewish state. Zionism was a response to an increasingly brutal climate for Jewish people, particularly in Europe and Russia, where there was a massive wave of anti-Semitism, including large-scale attacks in the late 1800s and early 1900s. After briefly considering other areas for a new state, including Uganda and Argentina, Zionist leaders decided on Palestine because of its connection to early religious history. But there was a third key group with political interests here, the British. Control of the region would allow them to expand their spheres of influence and protect trade routes to India. During World War I, since both the British and the Arab independence movement wanted Palestine, they decided to go after the Ottomans together with an important pledge. Through a series of letters in 1916, an Arab leader and a British official agreed that if Arabs would help the British fight the Ottomans and give the British economic and other foreign privileges in Arab lands, in return, the British would recognize and support an independent Arab state. Soon, the Arabs started doing their part in revolting against the Ottomans, making it easier for the British to move in. But the next year, the British issued a new declaration and betrayed the Arabs. In 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land, and the Jews were promised a national home in Palestine. Without consulting the native Palestinian population, the British issued what's known as the Balfour Declaration supporting the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. So instead of supporting the idea of Palestine as part of a unified and independent Arab state, the British pledged to help secure this land for Zionists. It was a strategic move. This declaration opened up a pathway for Britain to gain power in Palestine. Under the guise that it was supporting the self-determination of another people, of a people in Palestine who don't reside there yet. As for Palestine's majority Arab population, the declaration referred to them as non-Jewish communities, who would be given civil and religious rights, but not political rights. A few years later, after World War I ended, Britain gained control of Palestine through a mandate that also required them to put the Balfour plans for Jewish settlement in motion. And they did. Between 1922 and 1931, the Jewish population more than doubled. The migration helped the Zionist movement gain steam, and a slogan took off, a land without people for a people without land. And it sends a message to Western leaders that the people who had been living in Palestine for generations could just be easily moved elsewhere. The idea was that those inhabitants weren't a people with ties to that land. Palestine was, of course, a land with a people. In 1931, there were more than 850,000 Palestinian Arabs in the region, still the vast majority. But with the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party in particular, hate became a rallying call. Jewish flight from Europe became even more urgent, and Palestine started to see the biggest wave of Jewish immigration yet. Violence broke out, rooted in tensions over land. 
Jewish settlers purchased swaths of fertile land and evicted tenant farmers, creating a crisis of hundreds of thousands of landless, dispossessed Palestinian Arabs. Though Palestinians fiercely rebelled against both British colonial forces and Jewish settlers, they were brutally crushed by the British. They put in Palestine more troops to repress that rebellion than they had stationed in India at that time, all of India. These troops killed thousands of Palestinians, including many of their leaders, and the British began training and arming Zionist militias to suppress the rebellion too. But the rebellion continued. So in an attempt to prevent further Palestinian resistance, the British began to limit Jewish immigration into Palestine. This ended up angering Zionist extremists, leading to more violence. So in 1947, after decades of trying to manipulate both Palestinian Arabs and Zionists to keep their control over Palestine, Britain gave up and handed the question of Palestine to someone else. Through the United Nations also came the problem of Palestine. In recent years, this small country had been the scene of disorder and bloodshed. They figured there is this new thing called the United Nations. Here, in your lap, Palestine, first gift. So the United Nations has now to figure out how do you disentangle this thing that the British helped create a UN special committee proposed the land be divided into two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state, with Jerusalem as a separate UN-controlled entity. It was called the Partition Plan of 1947. The plan shocked Palestinians. We could not accept the Partition Plan because at that time the population were almost two to one. But the plan proposed giving over half the land and often the most fertile areas to the Jewish state. From a purely pragmatic perspective, the partition plan didn't make much sense for Palestinian Arabs. That wasn't the only problem with the plan. Within this proposed area of the Jewish state were hundreds of thousands of Palestinian Arabs, including both Muslims and Christians, who had lived there for generations. On a moral level, the idea of making hundreds of thousands of Palestinian Arabs minorities in their own homeland seemed unjust and unfair. In November 1947, the UN put the plan to a vote. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, and after lobbying from US leaders and Zionists, the UN voted in favor of partition. And finally, a momentous decision to partition the Holy Land's 10,000 square miles. Britain announced their mandate over Palestine would end on May 15, 1948, even as Palestinians continued to reject the UN's decision to partition the land. After the partition took place, you know, in 1947, you know, we really were scared something might happen to us. By the end of 1947, Zionists had several well-developed paramilitary forces, the largest one known as the Haganah, and more extremist militias like Irgun. On March 10th, a couple of months before the British mandate would end, the Haganah adopted what was called Plan Dalit, or Plan D. On paper, the main goal was to gain control of the Jewish state, as laid out in the partition plan while also defending Jewish settlements outside of the borders. In reality, that's where the majority of these operations took place, outside of the UN's proposed Jewish state, some carried out by Haganah and others by more radical militias. Many of these operations focused on isolating Jerusalem and the roads to it. A set of brutal instructions called for the destruction of Arab villages by setting fire to, blowing up, and planting mines, especially those population centers which were difficult to control. In case of resistance, it called for the population to be expelled outside of the borders of the state, villages emptied, and for the occupation and control of Arab villages along main transportation arteries. One of the most widely publicized village massacres happened here in Deir Yassin. We lived in Deir Yassin, which is about four miles west of Jerusalem. 91-year-old Dawood Assad was there the day of the massacre and was 18 at the time. We saw one night, that night, the night before, there was movement of lights, armored trucks moving around, moving, moving like this. So we know that something is wrong. That's why we knew that something is going to happen to our village. On April 9th, 1948, extremist Zionist forces, executing Plan D, closed in on Deir Yassin, even though the village had made a local peace pact with neighboring Jewish settlements. Friday morning, they attacked us. My uncles, they were shooting at them. And I was at there loading the gun for them and shooting. We fought about almost two and a half hours. 
they found my uncle and they put him on the wall and they shot him eight bullets in cold blood. My grandmother, she went in the village to see my mother. On her way, she got shot. My brother Omar fell from her shoulder to the floor, but the floor was a concrete one. Dawood escaped through a trench. I went down all the way down here like this. So it was four hours walking to Jerusalem. To this day, the archive of the Israeli army refuses to release many of the images and intelligence reports on Dar Yassin. But one UN report detailed circumstances of great savagery, including women and children stripped, lined up, photographed, and slaughtered. Roughly 100 people, largely children and the elderly, were killed in the village. As for Dawood, he later reunited with the group of Dar Yassin captives in Jerusalem, including his sister and mother. My mother says, where is your uncle Radwan? He says, he was shot. Where is your grandmother? He says, he was shot and Omar was with her. So everybody has a commotion, you know. Where is Fatma? Where is Ibrahim? Where is Amariam? Where is David? Where is Ahmed? Where is Ismail? I dream, I'm a dream about it, you know. News of what happened in Dar Yassin spread quickly, with far-reaching effects. The Zionist militias used it as a propaganda tool to tell people about it everywhere. The idea was that if you don't leave, we will do to you what happened in Dar Yassin. Stories came out about women being raped, about babies being killed, and induced a great deal of fear among the Palestinian Arab population, many of them fleeing as a result. Jewish troops routed Arab forces from the city of Haifa. After taking Dar Yassin, Zionist paramilitary groups cleared major cities, including Haifa and Jaffa, and took hundreds of smaller villages and towns too. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forced to flee, pouring into neighboring states as refugees. Plan D became the blueprint for carrying out the ethnic cleansing of historic Palestine to make room for a new state. And on May 14th, the day before the British mandate ended, Zionists declared this state as Israel. But the creation of Israel didn't end the Nakba. Neighboring Arab countries that were overwhelmed by Palestinian refugees immediately went to war with Israel. Now united in a League of Arab States, they are insistent that the entry of refugees into Palestine must be ended. The fighting lasted for months. Arab armies eventually lost while Palestinians continued to be killed and forced out throughout that time. Palestinians who fled often carried only enough to stay away for a few weeks, hoping they'd eventually return home. A lot of them locked their doors, put their key in their pocket, and then moved to safer ground. When you leave the house and you take your key with you, it's because you're planning to go home. In the case of the Palestinians, those refugees weren't allowed to return. Refugees trying to return were often shot at. Zionist paramilitary operations also tried to prevent them from returning again by destroying the villages. That act of preventing their return compounded the Nakba. So the Nakba is both the forcible displacement of Palestinians from their homes and lands and country, as well as preventing them to return once the fighting was over. Palestinian society was dismembered, crushed. More than half of the Palestinian people became refugees, stateless, dispossessed of their land. Over time, the state of Israel covered up the physical evidence of an Arab Palestine. Place names were often changed from Arabic ones to Hebrew ones. The Jewish National Fund embarked on a massive effort to plant thousands of acres of pine forests and recreational areas on top of hundreds of ruined Palestinian villages. Even though these forests have now grown into big pine trees, Palestinians have not forgotten their homelands. While we know that roughly 6,000 Israelis lost their lives in the violence of the Nakba, records for Palestinian deaths weren't kept. It's estimated to be around 15,000. By the end of the Nakba, roughly 750,000 Palestinians had been forcefully expelled, and more than 500 villages destroyed. Though the UN's partition plan allotted Israel 56% of the land, through the Nakba, Israel captured 78% of the land. 
It was everything except what's now known as the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. Today, that's up to at least 85% of the total area, turning 6 million Palestinians into refugees without a homeland. It's why, around the same time that Israelis are celebrating Independence Day, Palestinians are out protesting on May 15th, holding up keys as a symbol of the homes they lost and the hope to return. For them, the Nakba isn't just a moment in history. It's a catastrophe that never really ended. I dream, I'm a dream of ours, you know? We lived a good life till 1948 when we were displaced. Alhamdulillah, since we have uh, a relatively small group, we can all uh, share. So the, the idea is that we want to make it, um, you know, relevant to all the different situations that people are in. So just to set the stage a little bit, I think Sam and I can both talk a little bit about our own personal experiences uh, with, you know, Palestine activism and sort of the reactions that we that we get um, in different situations. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I think more helpful if we can hear from everybody who, uh, you know, made the time to come here just about your context, about some questions you might have. Um, and also, even if you have some questions about history, Osama maybe can answer those as well. Um, um, I really appreciate you. Even though I've known Osama for a long time, I've actually never heard that, that full story. So I really appreciate you sharing, um, you know, the story about your grandparents and your, and your, and your father. Osama's father is actually one of the founders of CARE. Um, so his family, mashallah, has a long history of uh, standing up for the Muslim community. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll open it up. Anyone have any, let's start with questions about the history of Palestine or context. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. I think it's So one thing I was, when I was watching the video, I, uh, I was wondering that the, um, you know, when all of that was going on, that was right after uh, the Holocaust and what happened in Germany and Poland and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the impression that is given to us and which is, I'm sure is correct, is that Jews, millions of them, they lost their lives and they, they were left with nothing and then they were the ones who were taken to Palestine. So what surprised me here was that, so where were they getting all these weapons and militias? I thought they were the, they had nothing when they went there. So was it the British providing them or what was going on there? If you could talk about it. So that's actually a really good question because there, I think one thing that gets overlooked was in Europe, there was what they call an anti-Semitism problem, uh, primarily in uh, England, Poland, Germany, and Russia. Uh, and this actually happened before the Holocaust. So the first Zionist convention was held in 1897 in Switzerland by Theodor Herzl, who's the kind of the founder of the Zionist movement. And essentially what had happened was the Jewish population had already, they already understood that they're not necessarily welcomed in Europe, even though they are Europeans. So he had established this idea that, okay, why don't we have our own homeland? That way we can run from this anti-Semitism problem in Europe and figure and kind of, you know, live on our own. So there were three options. There was Uganda, Argentina, and Palestine. And the one that made the most sense was Palestine because they can tie in the Jewish homeland, Jewish narrative, and the, uh, the fact that Jewish people believe that Jerusalem is also a holy site for them. So that's kind of the one piece. And then post Holocaust and what, what had happened to the Jewish people, uh, the, the majority of financial assistance that they received were from the British and were actually from organizations and Zionists that were living here in New York. And you know, they had an edge, so to speak, on the mili they had a military advantage. They even had a an educational and uh, advantage where 
the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem was actually established in the 1920s. And they only, uh, they had professors from Germany, Western Europe, United States, and at that time, you know, they held, uh, you know, the top, you know, universities top ranking. So they had visiting professors visiting there, and they only taught in Hebrew. So their whole claim was, anyone can join, but you have to learn Hebrew. So it excluded the, the Arab population. So there was also kind of a, an educational advantage that they had as well. One uh, suggestion I have is, I'll, I'll send the link, I'll figure out the link. There was a really good uh, interview with a Tunisian scholar. Uh, he's a scholar of Jewish studies. He's, he's Muslim. Uh, he grew up, because there's Tunisian Jews that, you know, still there, that still live there. So he actually grew up with the uh, Tunisian populations in Tunis. He has a very good three hour long interview that goes over the history of Zionism and how it relates to Judaism and what's happening now and what their, uh, what their goals are in the Middle East. Uh, how, for example, a lot of the universities in Israel, uh, you know, surprisingly, I'm, I mean, it's not surprising for Palestinians because we know this, but a lot of universities in Israel have, for example, the Islamic history in Uzbekistan, the Islamic history in Kazakhstan, what's happening in Saudi Arabia, because they have a much deeper knowledge and understanding of the region and how entrenched they are in there. So I'll, I'll find the link and I'll share it with you, but I, that's, if you want to get deep into it, that would be a really good, a good, really good way. Um, so one of the claims that I've heard that um, Israelis make is that they are indigenous to Palestine. And I was listening to um, an interview with Gabor Mate, who's a, he's actually one of the few Holocaust survivors himself. And, and I had thought of this before, and when I heard him say it, I was like, subhanAllah, like maybe this is, that if you look at, okay, like who has rights, like how we talk about Aboriginal or indigenous communities. So it, how does that fit? Like, could it be that the indigenous Palestinians, you know, I mean, do you go back to Beni Israel and then they converted to, some of them converted to Christianity and then through time converted to Islam where that they're all, they were all indigenous at that time and they were converted populations. So I'm kind of wondering what is like the understood history of that? Yeah, that's a, uh, <laughs> PhD thesis. <laughs> it's a really long one. First off, I'm actually a huge Gabor Mate fan as well. So, yeah, I read all those books. Uh, so we, the they're originally called the Philistines or the Canaanites, and I think so. Some of them were, for example, from Ben Israel. Some of them then converted to Christianity. Some of them converted to to Islam. Right. You also have, for example, the Crusades. Right. They came from. Italy, modern day Italy, Greece, Europe, they came in and a lot of them, you know, converted to Islam as well. I think the the argument of kind of going back and saying like, well, there were Muslims here. Well, who was before that? Then there were Jews. And then who was before that was Christians. That's, it's ironic because that's not the argument the Palestinians are making right now. What we're saying is there were Palestinian Jews who were ethnically cleansed. There were Palestinian Christians who were ethnically cleansed. And, there were Palestinian, and the majority were Palestinian Muslims because just de facto, the majority were Muslims. And they were all ethnically cleansed, and they're all facing the same discrimination because they were Palestinian, because they were there. So I think the argument of, of you know, like, well, who was there before? And then, you know, they, then they converted. The reality is that Palestine, pre-American history, and I think, you know, uh, if you read the history books, it was a melting pot. It was a complete melting pot. It was the it was the center of the world when it came when it came to trading. It was you know where East meets West, the Middle East, really. So it's a very diverse land, very diverse people, and I think the question of uh, you know the his, historic people who who was there first and then who has the claim over it, that's not actually what like Palestinians really argue about. Palestinians argue about is how you guys came and ethnically cleansed us. Yeah, so but I think the, the, again, like the claim for a lot of Palestinians, if you talk to a lot of them pre-1948, some of them were saying if, an, if a Jewish person came and bought some land from me and wanted to live here, there is no problem with that. I think the problem is the being forcefully kicked out. That's the, majority. That's, that's the real 
issue here. The issue is not that a Jewish person can come and live in the land. You can come and live and buy. And I know my grandfather, you know, he dealt with uh, Jewish merchants. So that's totally fine. I think the issue is how you took it. And it, it was the forceful expulsion of the Palestinian people. All right, good. So uh, we, we have about uh, 20 minutes before Asa. So I just wanted to get a sense of um, there's a lot of different, you know, contexts that this is coming up in. So uh, Osama is, uh, works at LinkedIn, so I think you know, there's a lot of people like in the tech community who are trying to figure out what's the, what's the way to deal with this in the workspace. Um, I'm an internal medicine uh, physician. I work at the, uh, actually I work at the Santa Rita County Jail. Um, so it's a different, <laughs> very different uh, context than most people work in. Um, and, and then we all live in communities like the grocery store and you know, public spaces and public schools are, um, and we navigate all these different spaces. So one of the goals of this uh, session is just to sort of help us all work through how we can uh, address Palestine in, the, in, in those situations. And I think in the past we would just say, oh, well, we just won't <laughs> because we don't have to. We won't talk about it. But now what's happening is you, the CEO of your company may have sent an email to everyone at your job saying all kinds of um, Islamophobic things, totally neglecting uh, any of the things we learned about in terms of the Nakba, but even just now, neglecting the fact that you know two million people are literally being, you know, barricaded into a open air prison and, and bombed from the from the sky and from the land and from the sea. Um, so, not talking about it sometimes is, is not an option anymore. Uh, and also, we have an imperative from our. Dean to, to speak the truth uh, and to uh, advocate for our brothers and sisters who are being oppressed. Uh, and so, yeah, the, you know, one of the things we want to accomplish here is just to talk about um, the different struggles we might be having trying to do that and, and to see if we can come up with some uh, helpful advice. So does anyone feel that they want to share something about like a message they got in, at a workspace or uh, you know, issues they're dealing with in, in, in other parts of their life in regards to Palestine? It's a small group. <laughs> Feel right. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, since you didn't get an answer to that, so I thought I could Please. ask a, a related question related to the previous discussion. Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, so when, when we're looking at the numbers, and I know there were, uh, there were uh, quite a sizable number of Christians in Palestine, and I, they were also part of the Nakba. They were displaced as well. Um, so I think uh, some people are trying to make it about Islam versus Judaism or Islam versus the West. And it's important for the Christian Palestinians who were displaced as well to come out and, and it's important for us to have those videos as well. And also, I, this is the first time I'm hearing that there were Jewish Palestinians as well who were displaced. So do you have any of those, that literature, information, videos that we could, uh, or Christian Palestinians coming out? Because I know for a fact, I was in uh, UT Austin, uh, I did my bachelor's from there. And the Palestinian uh, student organization was headed by a Palestinian Christian. And they were protesting against what happened. The same, same way, the same day when Israel was uh, celebrating their Independence Day, there were protests going on. They were headed by Christian Palestinians. But it's very rare to see them at, at a high level speak about these issues. Like, why is that? And how can that be? How can we resolve this Islam versus West that some people are trying to make it out to be? Yeah, so there there are actually a pretty good number of Palestinian Christians. They make about 15% of the population in Palestine. Uh, two days ago, or I think it was yesterday, the, Israel, the IDF actually bombed the uh, Baptist church, the oldest church in Gaza. Uh, and they are facing a lot of ethnic cleansing, as do, as do the Muslims you know, in Palestine as well. The their um, I don't I don't know much about like their doctrine, but their let's say version of like the Mufti, you know, he actually uh, uh, is very outspoken about uh, protecting Masjid Al Aqsa because of its uh, 
because of its importance in the Islamic religion. And there are a lot of uh, Palestinian Christians who do speak out. I think the difference is they they may not, because we all realize that we're all in the same on the same boat. They don't come out and say like you know I'm a Palestinian Christian and this is what's you know happened to Palestine. They just say I'm a Palestinian, and you know this is this is what's happening. There was a really good interview that Dina Takuri did. She's from AJ Plus. Uh, I'll maybe after the talk I can send it to you. She interviews a Palestinian pastor and he talks about the ethnic cleansing and what people are facing. The majority of Palestinian Christians they live in Jerusalem and uh, in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, because of obviously you know their significance, uh, you know those cities their significance, and there is a pretty sizable community in Gaza. Uh, one of the uh, former congressmen of this country, I think his name's Justin Amash. He was a congressman from 2011 2021. His cousins uh, were killed in the in the airstrike in uh, in Gaza yesterday. They were part of that Palestinian Christian community. So there is a sizable Palestinian Christian community, uh, and uh, I do think that they they do a lot of work, and they, there is a lot of cross cross work that's happening. So Alhamdulillah, you know that that's that's really good, and I can share with you the link after this. Yeah. There's Azmi Bashara as someone who, so part of it is who, you, who you're exposed to. Yeah. Because in, you know, American media and like, there's a lot. There's a lot of, and Azmi Bashara is a great example of like a Arab Christian, Palestinian Christian, public intellectual and politician who's very vocal, but I don't think he's ever been on CNN, right? So, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, the last couple of weeks, you know, I think for all of us, just it's, for me, it's been very difficult time management wise because I spend way too much time, you know, looking at videos, reading things, yeah. and it's probably not the best use of my time, right? Like, I can stay informed, but like, do I need to be informed within a minute? Um, but what I do think, you know, I see from like, you know, just all the videos or whatever that I've been watching are, is there is a change in perception, right? Especially, you know, like there's a sense that like, you know, the next generation does understand a lot more about the Palestinian problems uh, and the, you know, the, you know, the oppression they've been going under. Um, what, what do you attribute like the kind of like change in the generation and maybe more, a better question is what should we be doing to make sure that this next generation, right, uh, is convinced of, you know, you know, the situation of the Palestinians and how they need to protect these people. Um, Cause I don't think, I, I think the older generations, you know, they're done. They're not. Yeah. So I guess my question is like, what works oh, and what you know, works. what, what should we be doing to help convince more people? I think what worked and maybe Assad can also testify to this is actually a, uh, a college level activism. Uh, the SJPs and the MSAs that were very outspoken and I know at times a lot of older members in the community felt that they were either too outspoken or they pushed the boundaries a little too much or, you know, they were a little too, like, you know, uh, rocking the boat a little bit. And when I look back, I was talking to a, uh, you know, Sheikh Uthman Amarji. He came to MCA yesterday. So I was, I was talking to him and I was telling him that the majority of the people that I talk to now about what's happening and, like, how we strategize are the same exact people that when I was in, at UC Irvine with Assad, you know, we're all in the same group chat trying to figure out like what is the best way to strategize. So I think the the one thing that's helping a lot is that the MSAs from a very early on is their stance on Palestine is very clear. So that's that's I think the first. The second is also the internal dynamics that's happening in this country. You have uh, what happened, you know, obviously George Floyd in the beginning of COVID, uh, Trayvon Martin, where some. There was a uh, sociologist yesterday, she coined the Trayvon Martin generation, where basically people in their 20s and 30s when Trayvon Martin was murdered, how that kind of affected and shaped their view of this country and what happened to black people and how they still have not been able, how this country has not been able to reconcile what's been happening, what they did to them for the past two, three, four hundred years, you know. And I, there's a lot of intersectionality and with that. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's, you know, it's it's the best solution or it's the only solution but i do think just the fact that we were able to kind of shake things around uh, people woke up and the third i think it was just really the uh, failed 
Afghanistan and Iraq kind of post 9-11 rhetoric that this country engaged in. A lot of young people were, you know, under 40 years old, even uh, Americans who, you know, let's, let's be honest, they don't really care about the Middle East. They just care about their taxes or they just care about like, you know, what's going on in our public school system with all this, you know, social uh, push towards the left. A lot of people are just saying like, wait, wait a minute, what's going on here? Like, why are we sending so much aid to one country when, you know, you look, you just look, you know, in Sunnyvale, you see all these like homeless tents going around and we're not taking care of our own people. So there is a reality where people are waking up to. So I think it's a lot of things that kind of play into that. Uh, in order, in terms of uh, how to kind of work from now and how we push, I do think, you know, just to be, you know, transparent and honest, I think also as Palestinians, we need to work more in the narrative of how to push for people who are in the middle or people who don't know about the topic. We kind of speak, we like to speak a lot in our, to our own community and we're very ingrained in like the internal politics and what's going on and who said what, who said that. I don't think like John Smith and Pleasanton cares about like what's going on, <laughs> like what some politicians said. I think what they care more about is where their tax dollars is being used. So there is now a shift where we're trying to see who are the people kind of on the side or in the middle, a little bit confused. And you can kind of just shift that a little bit you know, that you're able to make a lot of headway and a lot of gains. Yeah, I, I would just, you know, to, to add to that, I think this is what you're, you're, what you're asking, but like, I think, so part of the stress of seeing all the news and stuff, which I agree with you, like, I, I'm not good at this, but I try to like have a limit for like how much time I spend because you can spend forever clicking through links and that's not helping anybody. Um, but at the same time, it's like a kind of a feeling of distress and panic because you're like, this is happening right now. And I don't want to just, it's hard to just move past that and go past your regular day as if, as if there aren't, you know, bombs falling, falling from the sky on, you know, children. So totally appreciate that. Um, I think another part of the stress comes from a feeling of helplessness. Like, you know, what can I, what, what can I do? One of the things that in, in my mind, there's two answers to that. The first is, even if, like, let's say I had some kind of guarantee that all pro-Palestinian activism is utterly useless and can't, and will affect zero change, right? Even then, I would say, you know, like an excuse in front of God, right? So one, one aspect of it is we, we are accountable, all of us are going to die and we're going to be accountable for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if we were to know that speaking the truth would have no material consequence, we should still do it so that we can say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we witnessed uh, injustice and we did something about it. Something. Alhamdulillah, that's not the case. We know that it actually does do a lot of things, right? Earlier today, a, a mutual friend of both of ours, uh, his name is Tahar Harzallah, we were, I was in college with him. We, we did a lot of uh, pro-Palestinian activism together. A sitting congresswoman actually tweeted out his name to the whole world, said, mentioned his name, Tahar Harzallah, and called him a, quote, very dangerous man. Okay? He's, he's, a, he's a, a currently a graduate student in Minnesota and um, previously worked for American Muslims for Palestine. I think maybe he still does. He still uh, does, still yeah. does, yeah. So he works for American Muslims for Palestine. So he's just a, he's just a community activist like, like any one of us. But a congresswoman is afraid of him and is saying calling him a, a very dangerous man. So our uh, work has a material effect in the world, especially if we are, educate ourselves and we, we try to channel our efforts in, a, in ways that are effective. Um, and like I said, more you know, for us as, as believers, it's also like it's in our scale of good deeds and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees our efforts regardless of the, of the outcome. So those are the two uh, you know, ways that I see it and um, that I try to you know, remind myself in terms of how to, how to use my own uh, efforts that we, we are more impactful than we think um, and the most important impact is is the one on the scale of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Assalamu alaikum we have a question from our online viewers my CEO sent a one-sided company-wide message about what's happening. Um, I reached out to the diversity folks. That's not working. What should I do next? I'm concerned that it will, this one-sided messaging will increase Islamophobia. 
um, I, I was mentioning to Usam that that's I think that's actually one of the spaces where we can have the most impact is uh, in in the workspace. And I have a few examples. I've um, I'm on some groups with Muslim doctors who uh, at Kaiser, for example, who try to uh, address this, and not just Muslims, but you know uh, people who you know have some sense of uh, what's happening in in Gaza and Palestine and want there to be justice. Um, so. There are ways, especially especially in work, because there's always there's always like a exposure risk that you're putting yourself in and and advocacy, right? So many times in in, the, in these settings, if you send a private email to HR or if you reach out um, directly to your CEO, the the doctors that actually I think at UCSF and Sutter here so they've been doing that as well. They got together and they wrote a joint letter, um, and they all signed it together, which is you know another strategy that can be very uh, helpful, and in in at least two or three cases, I saw responses from the C from the CEO. P part of it, part of what happened in this particular case is that people came out very hard after the initial attack from Hamas uh, on one side, you know, su supporting Israel. But now, anyone with any sense of decency, fairness, sees that there's literally thousands of people being uh, killed in Gaza, and they, um, and I think. And these people who have some sense of responsibility will take a more balanced approach. So I don't know if uh, LinkedIn, if you have some experience. Yeah, I think our experience was that, well, I think everyone's experience was when it first happened, the, there was obviously that one-sided message that went out. So I kind of set the framework. And then what had happened was the a lot of the Muslim groups or the some, some of them are Arab groups within the uh, companies got together. And what they started to realize that if three, four, or five of us send an email to HR, then they'll start to see that there's something brewing. Uh, so that's one step is to kind of unify, come together, and have several people send out emails. The second, and I think this is also uh, another one that you can leverage, is actually speak with your manager and talk about how, you know, these past two weeks have been rough. You know, I've been kind of stressed out. And then manager will kind of be like, well, why? What's going on? And then you can explain what's happening and how you do not like that message. So that goes up with management and they, they, they do take that very seriously. So there's a lot of ways around it. That's, those are the ways that I would uh, recommend. What we did at work was we, uh, because LinkedIn's part of Microsoft, so we're, there was kind of this Microsoft Muslim group that came together and what we did was we got people who worked in Jordan and the West Bank and because they have offices over there to speak out. So that it kind of tied into that their employees' safety, physical, and mental mental wellness was kind of tied together, so they couldn't really, you know, dodge it. They had they had to address this point. Absolutely. Because we 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 also have already seen that the consequences domestically, right? Like this anti this is straight straight up the rhetoric of the president is Islamophobic, absolutely without doubt. President Biden right now is is expressing the most vile forms of Islamophobia and showing absolutely zero regard for Muslim life. And that results in harms here for us, and, it re and it's already resulted in the killing of a, of a young boy and, and an attack on, on his mother. So that's also an important thing to emphasize in the messaging as far as when you're talking to your company or, or to other folks as well, is that the type of rhetoric that's being um, propagated right now by the pro-Israeli side is Islamophobic, dehumanizing, and affects us here in our communities in America. Um, we have to take a break. It's uh, for Asad, inshallah, and then we'll resume. Jazakumullah. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa salli wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin. Nuri kasari wa nadi kal jari wa jma'inu fi kulli atwari wa ala alayhi sahbihi salam ya nur. Alhamdulillah. So we're going to um, resume, inshallah. I think this one is sufficient. Okay. We're going to resume, inshallah, and we're going to start off just by addressing um, two aspects of this. Uh, one is the type of principles that we should keep in mind as we are engaging in conversations, whether it's at work or in like the broader public square. And then we'll, inshallah, also try to have time for like just how we process this from a spiritual and metaphysical perspective, um, because it's, it, it is difficult to see so much human suffering and adversity. Um, so uh, we'll start and then definitely we'll pass it to the brothers to, to share. Um, when we are talking about these types of um, subjects, there's spiritual principles that we need to keep in mind of, char of character and akhlaq, and then there's principles to keep in mind of how you actually convey the argument that you're trying to convey. 
spiritually, the first thing is don't, we should be very careful to get um, emotional or angry when these, we, it's valid for us to be angry of what's going on. But when we're trying to have a conversation or a dialogue, um, the thing that works for most people is actually using like logic, intellect, history uh, to try and convey the points. Um, already as Muslims, there is a context for the last 40, 50 years in this country where people have painted Muslims in a very specific way. They're angry, they're terrorists, they're violent. So people are putting that hat on as a stereotype, whether they're aware of it or not, when they are talking to us. And so if we, in their mind, quote unquote, fulfill that, that's going to already tilt the conversation in one side. And so we want to just make sure that we're very level-headed, reasonable, logical. And when we're feeling emotional, when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're feeling just upset and angry about everything that these uh, uh, Zionist occupiers are doing to our people, we have spaces to process that. But I would not recommend, and you know, brother, feel free to disagree, but I would not recommend, don't process that type of stuff at work with your colleagues who don't know the conflict, who don't know the history. So that's one. The second thing is that facts and history and context and laws um, they tend to work well for people who themselves have a level of, you know, they consider themselves intellectual, especially professionals and, and, and whatnot. They, they, they like to hear those things. And if you use those things and convey those things in the right way, it can have an impact. Um, so that's where I think the history uh, that was just walked through, having an understanding from the time of the late 1800s when the Zionist movement started, clarification on what Zionism is, is a, is a racist, white supremacist ideology, not a Jew, no, it's not Judaism, it's not the same thing. Understanding when the Balfour Declaration happens in 1917 and when they make this intention to take over the land. Understanding that the British basically took, seized the land, they took it from the Ottomans and then they um, uh, decided basically unilaterally and then convinced the rest of the governments that they're going to give this land to the Jews. And understanding violently the specific events that took place with facts, figures, how many homes were demolished, how many hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were displaced displaced, how many um, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people have been killed. Those facts tend to help in certain contexts, so just having that ready. The third thing is use, when appropriate, articles, books, videos, depending on the generation you're talking to, not always coming from Muslim sources. There are many people who are Jewish, who are rabbis even, who are speaking out and have been speaking out against this for 60, 70 years. Um, or for, for 40, 50 years, let's say, right? And it's amplified in the last 20 years as the Zionist regime has like gotten worse and worse and worse in their oppression. So also feel free to direct people towards those books. Try to read them ourselves. There's videos that are going around. If you're talking to like Gen Z or millennials, a, a one, two minute TikTok video might be good. YouTube video, if you're talking to somebody who likes long form articles, there's articles that have been written, I think, um, I'm forgetting the name of the author, but I have it written here, so I'll check in a second. But Elon Pape has an excellent book on um, uh, uh, the, the ethnic cleansing of, Pal of, of Palestine or of Palestinians. Um, so you can point people to there. He's, he's you know, European, Caucasian, right? So there's a new, there's not like it's not that this person is Muslim. They are talking about it from a quote unquote neutral perspective. And then same thing when it comes to human rights violations, Geneva Convention violations, international law violations. It's powerful when you quote somebody who is objective, like an objective lawyer who is not necessarily Muslim, and who's saying, hey, look at all these laws that have been violated in the last, and there's literally hundreds of laws that these that the occupiers have violated. We're not talking about five or ten. I mean, they, it's continual, um, and you point them out. So those are a couple of principles just to kind of keep in mind when we are um, engaging and always to maintain our comportment, our form, um, and then also to know when you should engage somebody and when we shouldn't engage somebody. So as Allah says in the Quran, that when the jahil approaches you, meaning like in this case, you say peace. So if somebody's super Zionist, built in their views, like they're not going to change. They have a strategy. I was talking about this with one of my friends the other day who's, you know, mashallah, been in, he's a Palestinian. He's been an activist for um, 10, 20 years. You might know Sidi Majdi, uh, Majdi Faith. Um, anyhow, he's, he was saying that one of the tactics that they use is just to exhaust you. Like they'll just keep going and pushing and pushing to just exhaust you because as deep-rooted Zionists themselves, just like a deep-rooted white supremacist, it's, it's unlikely you're going to convince them that they're wrong. What we have to focus our energy on are the people who don't know much about this. Quote, unquote, 
they can be more in the middle about this, right? They might not be in the middle right now because they're believing the pro-Zionist propaganda that the media is propagating, that the Western governments are propagating, but they could be convinced if someone paints the picture to them and the story to them in the correct way. We shouldn't waste our, our time with like people who are so gone, far gone that they're just gonna push and push and push. Um, and then the second thing is when you identify those people, uh, just know when it's time to leave the argument. Like, okay, you know, lakum din kum Like, you guys do what you're gonna do. Like, we're gonna do. We're gonna. It's not. We're not gonna reach a a, a understanding here. Um, right? And and uh, what was it? Yeah, yeah. Don't. There's no need to like stress strangle it or to like over overdo it and and to like I have to win this argument. Um, from a spiritual perspective, remember, like the goal is truth. The goal is not um, uh, at the end of the day to like flex your nafs and your our muscle of like, well, we're the best people. No, it's, this is the truth and this is wrong objectively and it's wrong in every way possible what these people are doing. Um, and so we just have to kind of keep that keep that in mind. So um, with that, brothers, anything you guys want to add when it comes to professionally, how we engage, and then maybe we talk about like the rest. That was, that was great, Barakal Afiq. I'll add just a couple quick points. I think one good rule in communication in, in general um, that definitely applies in this case. Uh, you know, we say like in medicine, first do no harm. So the first, the first rule in communication is don't say something that hurts. If you can't you say something that's going to be beneficial or helpful, you know, don't say anything at all. The Prophet said, if the one who believes in Allah and the last day, let him say good or be silent. So part of that is preparation. So, you know, if learning the facts are for ourselves, feeling confident in them, um, feeling, you know, um, g gaining some skills in terms of how to communicate those facts uh, and how to discuss with people and the proper way to do so um, helps so that we can say something good. But if you're feeling, the other thing is sometimes people feel pressured to say something that they don't really believe uh, because they're in a certain context, because you know, certain people around them expect them to see them. So they say something that they don't really believe just to set, just to satisfy someone else. And that's, and that's not good either. We want to say things that uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us about them on the day of judgment, we feel happy that we said them and we can stand behind them. So um, I would say that's the first step is don't say something harmful. And that happens. I've been to many protests where people say things that are not helping anybody. Um, and so, that's that's the first step. Is don't don't we should all be careful not to not to say something that will that'll harm us in this life or be harmful towards our brothers and sisters in this life or for us in the akhirah. Um, and the, the second piece that I would say is we all have to do like a sort of a self assessment of of where we are, who we are, and our context, what we can do, right? Um, I mentioned before my friend uh, Tahar Hazallah, who's you know obviously a, a, a activist on the national stage. He's you know, speaking on, you know, national networks and um, he's, you know, in many ways dedicated his life to, the, to this cause uh, and has taken a lot of um, targeting of himself, of his family, personal loss um, in, in, that, in that way. I'm, I, I have, I'm not ready to do that level, right? But I can do something just because I can't do you know, like because you can't accomplish something in its entirety doesn't mean that you abandon it in its entirety. We can do something. So part of it is sort of like taking a, a, an assessment of where are we? You know, what can we do? And what I would say is we all have a comfort zone. Maybe, maybe some of us don't ever talk about Palestine and don't ever communicate with our workers about politics and stuff. Uh, and, and that's sort of like a generally considered a taboo. But by our CEO sending an email to everybody, they've opened that door. So they've allowed it to be discussed in that space. So put, what my, my point there is, see where you are, see how comfortable you are, push yourself a little bit. Push yourself a little bit to advocate more for our brothers and sisters. If you've never spoken about this to a colleague before, talk about it to your friend who you know is sympathetic, who you know knows you and trusts you. Speak about it with them over coffee. You know, I, I had that experience myself at work with to you know, three different coworkers who I generally don't talk to about politics, but this week, you know, they just asked me, you, you, you know, what's going on? They can tell that I that I that I look like I'm down, like I'm, you know, sad. And so I, instead of saying nothing or blowing it off, I actually told them. Um, and alhamdulillah, the conversation, you know, progressed from there. 
same thing with, I had a neighbor, same thing I had a conversation with this week who asked me a similar question and I was able to open up with him and talk with him. Whereas I've never talked to him about politics before. And I was surprised at how willing to listen that they were. It's a lot, it helps a lot of times when you have a relationship with that person. They already know you, so they're not going to assume all these evil, bad things about you immediately based on their bias. So, yeah, that, those are my two advice. So don't, first, do no harm. Number two, see where you're at, see where you're comfortable, push forward from that. You know, and again, the, a, a lot of, we want to have an impact in this world, but a lot of it is, you know, we we want to have some deeds that we can be proud of in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say that we you know we spoke up for our brothers and sisters uh, I mean I think they've said it all the only thing that I would say is because um, I, I get this question asked a lot primarily from younger Palestinians and uh, obviously when you experience it or when you have relatives that have uh, been martyred in Gaza and whatnot there's a lot of uh, emotions so yesterday there was one brother, Dr. Mohammed Sobah, he's, he's also a medical doctor, he's in the emergency medicine in uh, the Stanford. He, uh, he, I think 30 members of his family passed away in Gaza. And uh, he was very calm and he actually gave uh, two pieces of advice. He said, number one is know your audience. Like meaning that, you know, if you're gonna speak to a group of doctors, you should know like how to kind of push the narrative from the medical standpoint, for example, like what's happening in the hospitals or whatnot. The second thing he said, and I think this is really important, is if you want people to stand up for Palestine who are not Palestinians or not Muslims, you also have to leverage the relationships and stand up for their causes that they're facing. Because don't expect, you know, sometimes you can't expect that reciprocal response if, you're, if, you, were, if you weren't there with, for them when they were down. For example, if a coworker family passed away, family member passed away, and you reached out to them. People take this into account. So when they see you, that you're down, and you actually talk to them and tell them, they're not. They're going to come and say, you know what, this person's actually a really nice person. You know, when I was down, they were, they were there for me. So now I'm going to lower my ego, or I'm going to lower myself to actually understand what's happening and take it from a place of humility so that, and then maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will then open their heart to actually see the truth and not believe what the media has been feeding them. Is there yeah, any, anyone wants to share questions or comments? Anyone just wants to share? It could be just you know what a conversation you had with your neighbor, a coworker, or it's a conversation you want to have but don't feel comfortable having yet. So I'm going to take advantage of the group and just hear how everyone's dealing with things. Assalamu alaikum. Some of us needs to deal with work with uh, some Jews in a professional capacity. And in the last few years, and particularly in the last few weeks, um, at least it's observable to, uh, to me and a few others, that sometimes the position that they take, particularly in this uh, event, is in a continuum. Right? There are some people who are clearly demonstrating the um, white supremacist mentality, but there are also you know, people who, they don't agree with their government, they don't even support the movement, but they can't you know, openly clear, uh, openly state their position about that. So, do you have any thought on that? Um, and how do we deal with this uh, particular situation? So, if if uh, Bismillah, if if the person who you're speaking with, let's say, like if they're of the Jewish faith and they practice the Jewish faith, right? Uh, the thing I would start with is like understand the tenets of the Jewish faith that are being violated with the Zionist agenda. So like three things I would regularly quote for like the Ten Commandments. There's three of the Ten Commandments, which they just, the Zionists in their claim to form a Jewish state are completely ignoring. One is thou shall not kill. And the next is thou shall not steal. The next is thou shall not covet thy neighbor's house. Those are Ten Commandments revealed to Musa alayhi salam that we, that we believe as Muslims and that Jews and Christians all believe. Okay, they're stealing their neighbor's houses, like left and right, the, the occupation forces and the settlers, they've stolen millions of acres of land that didn't belong to them. And I mean, they're murdering and heinously killing tens of thousands of innocent souls in this process. And so uh, many Jews themselves will quote the Torah when, they're def when they are um, defending the Palestinians and saying, again, this is not Judaism, this is not Judaism. So sometimes you have to remind people who are Jewish of like, hey, this isn't your faith. So how do you understand? Just like when Muslims were, where we were told, which we know, right, when things are being done in the name of Islam, 
by groups that are not actually following the religion of Islam, we all said, no, this is not Islam. And here's where they're going wrong and where they're misquoting and misusing. So that would be number one, um, just kind of understanding that. Uh, and then if you guys have anything else you want to add, that, that's the main thing I was thinking of. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100% with what uh, Sidi Shahra said. And then the, the, what I would just add is in terms of like the knowing your audience that Osama was, was mentioning before. I've, I've had some um, friends who work in certain places deal with coworkers who were like, um, who were behaving very rudely, <laughs> you know, to say the least, and aggressively and basically like openly expressing sort of Islamophobic sentiments and things like that. So that's another situation that people might find themselves in where they have like a coworker or a boss who's basically harassing them and, um, or, or, you know, treating them in a very rude way. So that takes a different strategy, right? So, you know, I would definitely reach out to HR and, you know, sometimes if it passes to the extent of discrimination or something like that, then, you know, you go, you go in that direction, but then, you, you also mentioned there are some people who are very sympathetic and very so you, you deal with each one accordingly right so the people who are willing to to, to open up and talk you know you can have the kind of conversation that uh, Sidi Shahrar was was mentioning uh, and then but but also don't allow yourself to be discriminated against like and I've had at least three or four people come to me and tell me you know they were dealing with outright discrimination <coughs> and harassment in the workplace so um, don't feel pressure to be silent about that or to just put your head down and, and move forward. Um, you know, alhamdulillah, we're, we have, you know, in the, in the aftermath of 9-11, of the Muslim community in America has, you know, grown a lot in terms of a lot of institutions and knowing how to deal with discrimination. And I think um, Brother Munir is working on putting on like a know your rights uh, thing here at the Meshid. Um, we do not need to just be silent and accept those kinds of things. So if any of us is dealing with that type of hostile environment, that's not the setting to discuss. <laughs> that's the setting to protect your rights, protect the rights of your fellow, uh, you know, other Muslim coworkers and other people, because people who have that kind of attitude are usually harassing many other people, not just one or two. So. I mean, I would just echo Asad's uh, last point. Uh, staying silent is actually going to be very detrimental. And we've uh, learned that in the post 9-11 uh, some folks decided to stay silent and I'm not I, I'm some of it is justified because of you know the scare tactics that were used and a lot of people uh, Muslims especially Palestinians were like I'm getting 9-11 vibes like I'm getting these you know 9-11 vibes and I think the best thing that we did was we just still kind of spoke out because the more we spoke out the more we kind of broke out of this shell we, we kind of got rid of this fear that was always kind of hovering over us. So definitely just continue to speak out. And especially, you know, here in America, like we have our rights, we have care, we have other organizations, even for Palestine, Palestine we, have, we have an organization called Palestine Legal, which is like the care for Palestinian activists. You know, you can think of it as that way. So you have rights, you know, you can speak out obviously with wisdom, with manners and with, with a purpose and with a clear mission and goal. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, tomorrow there is a Muslim, United Muslim for Palestine rally organized in Auckland, uh, Oscar Grand Plaza, I think 14th and Broadway. Uh, I'm thinking of taking my family and a bunch of other families. And some of them are already boycotting me. <laughs> families, they say, oh, don't go. Things have become bad to worst. Yeah, yeah it's, it's true. But as you said, 9 11 wipes is the same thing. So I'm, I'm actually concerned about my children. Actually, my daughter is, my older daughter is quite a, quite a radical activist uh, in United San Francisco State. Alhamdulillah that she's having profiled and all that. You know, if you know what is the Jewish profiling like uh, Canary Mission yeah. has already profiled her. But anyway, that's under control. And she went for a program to see to learn do's and don'ts when you go to a rally. As you said, we have to have our humility without offending. At the same time, we, I recognize my rights. At the same time, I, I can sound, you know, nasty because my voice is already cranky. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm saying people take it wrong. And I see this in my Facebook page. Uh, 
some of my employees' uh, body language has completely changed. It's like they are like having the Israeli flag on their picture, and you know they update these things, you know. Yeah. And I just uh, send some information, uh, and then he's sending the sad picture. Like reply is not okay, what? not sad. It's just sad, and we share the sad, but I feel sorry for the 1.2 billion Muslims. You know, imagine. So you you have to say, "Kulia el kafirun." I don't want to involve anymore, so I'm not going to waste my precious time trying to rationalize with this kind of uh, not misunderstanding. It's been arrogantly misunderstood, you know. So, if you could advise, uh, I can share with my family and this bunch of other families tomorrow, anticipating to participate in Auckland. Um, do's and don'ts in the sense of uh, how much they are profiling us how it has gone bad to worst and so forth and so on. So uh, I'm not afraid I don't care because I lived my life, you know. I even almost, I'm, I'm surviving today because last year I had stage five cancer. But I'm concerned about my future children, you know, their generation. What are the challenges that they will be facing down the line? I, I am ready to go anywhere today. I already went to Allah and I said, Allah, take me if you can't heal me. But alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I got healed, hundred <laughs> percent. So, my rule of thumb, in general, whether it's protest or whatever I say, is I always tell people anything that I say in private or public, I know that I can defend it. So that's just my my rule of thumb. I'll never say something that I cannot defend. Um, so that's put that out there. The second, I think maybe Assad, you can speak to this because he's. One of the Irvine Eleven, which were the uh, one of the people that stood up against the um, Ambassador Oren, uh, and I think all of them all prospered in their careers. Every one of them was threatened that they will no longer, you know, become a doctor. You won't get into this medical school. You won't get into this law school. You won't be able to do this. Every single person that had a mission or whatever they wanted to do got into the school that they wanted to get into. They even excelled in their in their career whenever they wanted to, and alhamdulillah, they're living, you know, very happy right now. So I do think there is kind of this facade, a little bit that they kind of that they want to scare us. The third I would say is I encourage people to go to protest, and the reason why I encourage it is not so much to go out and just like scream and whatnot, but to go out and see the different people that are there advocating for you, to see the black Muslims, to see the non-Muslims to, to see your Jewish brothers and sisters, to see the, you know, uh, indigenous people of this land, you know, the people that were, that suffered in here, the Latino, the Hispanics, everyone who is pretty much what they coined the global south, or people who are not, you know, uh, white supremacists, they understand, you know, what the Palestinians are going through. And I think in moments like these is you do need that uh, cohesiveness and the kind of the spiritual or the mental just leaning on one another to see that there's other people advocating for Palestinian rights. I think that that really does help, especially in these moments when things are just really bad in Gaza. Yeah, I'll say, Michelle, I'm glad that you're going, inshallah, and taking your family and trying to encourage others to go. Um, we went last weekend. My, my wife is uh, pregnant, due in a couple weeks, and I have a three-year-old daughter. We went to the protest in San Francisco. We took the BART. We went to the protest in San Jose. Um, and I, yeah, so, so some people I told were like, oh, why, why would you? <laughs> it's not as, you know, there's, there's a lot of levels to the, to the question that you asked. It's a deep question. You know, one level is how much are we willing to, to sacrifice? Alhamdulillah, many of us, uh, in the not everybody, we, there are homeless people here. There are people who are dealing with all kinds of difficult challenges. But many of us living uh, in the Bay Area and many of the Muslims in, in this area have, you know, from a material point of view, a very comfortable life. Um, and everyone likes comfort. <laughs> uh, but the challenge, you know, you can't read, uh, you know, hardly a page in the Quran of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talking about jihad and mentioning struggling in his cause. It's very difficult to read the Quran without coming across those concepts. And I think it's important that we reflect a little bit about 
what are we willing to sacrifice for and how much are we willing to sacrifice? And I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not, everyone has different levels, right? I think I was mentioning to Sidi Shahrayat earlier, like, you know, wherever we are, we want to go higher. Whatever we're, whatever we're willing to sacrifice now, we want to, we want to push ourselves to, to do a little bit more uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all aspects, in our ibadah, in our learning of his deen and in, in everything. Um, uh, and, you know, in, in many ways, they, the Sahaba sort of exemplified that for us because they are definitely trying to intimidate. Absolutely. Which is part of the reason why I do not share these links about like, I know Canary Mission is a horrible organization uh, and these other people who, because their goal is to intimidate and they want to intimidate because it's effective. Right. And so um, I, I think, you know, I'll speak for myself. I refuse to be intimidated. And I think we should refuse to let our children feel intimidated and we have to stand up to that. And we have to be able to say, just because you say the word anti-Semitic does not make it anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic has a real meaning to it. It actually means something and it means genuine hatred for uh, Jewish people and discrimination against them. And that's absolutely has nothing to do with what we're doing, right? So just because they keep saying the word doesn't make it true. Uh, and I think we should refuse to be intimidated we should, uh, you know, use the resources that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave us to, to stand up, um, and uh, and speak. About, and the, the example that he gave. So when I when I was in college, you know, I was involved in a in a protest against the Israeli ambassador. We were arrested. The university initially suspended us. They actually disbanded the Muslim Student Union entirely, like shut it down. They banned me. I was the president of the union. They banned me, so that I couldn't be president, so that I couldn't serve as an officer. Suspended me from the university. The you know, very racist, horrible district attorney of Orange County filed misdemeanor charges against us. You know, we went, a whole long story went to trial, got two, two misdemeanor convictions. You know, that was while I was trying to apply to medical school. I went to medical school. I interviewed at 15 different medical schools or 16 different medical schools. And almost everywhere I go, someone's asking me like, so are you a terrorist? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> like, does this mean you're a terrorist? Because it says here that you were, you know, arrested for, you know, advocating for Palestine and Palestinians are terrorists. And you were protesting for Palestine, so you're probably a terrorist. Um, and those people are ignorant, you know? And I did my best to communicate what I did and why I did it. And I absolutely stand behind, you know, what I did. And that sacrifice is what? I got two misdemeanors and I had to talk to a few people. What is that? People are literally sacrificing their lives. People are literally dying. So it's, 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 a, it's relative. And, you know, I'm also, you know, I think not just not just a belief that I have, but I think it's part of our religion to know that when you when you give up something up for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're sincere in that, he always replaces it with something better. Always, every single time. So if, we, if we're sincere in that intention and we uh, do it with that intention, I have no doubt that any of the people listed on Canary Mission or, or tried to be intimidated in anything, any other way, whatever harm comes to them in this dunya, even in this dunya they will receive something better and what awaits them in the akhirah is much, much, much greater. So that, that's part of their tactics to intimidate us. Alhamdulillah that we know that we, there's something beyond this material world. Alhamdulillah. Because if we didn't know that, we might be intimidated. But because we know that there is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a day of judgment, there is an akhirah, then their, their strategies inshallah are meaningless. Um, thank you. To, to kind of piggyback off that, um, now that like, I feel like pub because public opinion has kind of shifted and people are calling for a ceasefire, what are, what are we calling for still? Because we know, you know, having witnessed this for 75 years, that a ceasefire, what, people in Gaza are just going to go back to their, like, rubble, rubble homes now? So what are we, I guess, practically, politically, in this moment calling for? Um, is, it, is it reasonable to say, like, and the siege, is it reasonable to say? And the occupation? Or are we just calling for ceasefire? <laughs> Not reasonable, but you know, like... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. I think what's... Um, when it comes to advocating, especially like in, on kind of on the politics and, and what can we do, I think the number one thing that we have to really understand, and a lot of Israelis will, will admit this, is that without the U.S. aid, Israel will not be able to maintain the occupation. So as citizens or residents of this country, it's our moral obligation to one, ask why are we funding an occupation? 
with our with our own tax dollars, three point eight billion dollars, and now they've request now Biden wants to give them another fourteen billion. And two, there's even if we give them aid, there's also something called the Leahy Law, which is uh, coined after Senator Patrick Leahy, who stated that any uh, foreign aid that's given to any country should uh, should not be used to violate human rights. So that definitely puts Israel like number one, right? And we've tried to pass a bill called the McCullum Bill, which was um, uh, making sure that any uh, uh, Palestinian children that get arrested in the West Bank, that none of that is used for, n n none of that, none of those resources were used um, via US aid. And if they are, that they're given a translator, that their parents can go visit them in jail, because right now they cannot, because it's uh, West Bank Palestinians are under a military law. They're not under uh, Israeli civil law. So I think those are actually like the practical ways to be to be uh, quite honest. Without the U.S. aid, there is no way for the Israeli government to execute their occupation of the Palestinian people, and that's they've they're very open about it. And we're talking about weapons uh, through the uh, military industrial complex. We're talking about security systems through HP, through organizations, uh, through companies like Microsoft and HP that provide. Uh, uh, the ability to scan faces so they can track the movement of the Palestinians in the West Bank, and so there's a lot of a lot of ways. I think the last one I, I shouldn't forget about should should not forget about this one is BDS, boycott, divestment, sanctions. And I think one of the most practical ways, it's not just a product that you buy, but also like you know your 401k. Are you invested in Lockheed Martin? Are you invested in Raytheon? A lot of these. You know, 401ks, they go through funds, so they're, you know, mixed. So a lot of companies are kind of mixed up. Have that conscious to be like, I'm not going to invest in this company. You know, I'm not going to work there or I'm not going to, uh, you know, buy this index fund, even though it may be more lucrative. You know, the returns might be 10% versus investing in a halal fund that's like, you know, 3 4%. Uh, I know because, you know, I work at a tech company, so they don't look so doesn't look good when it's like you're like, I'm making 3% year over year and this guy's making like 15% because they're invested in Lockheed and all these other companies, right? But that's the conscious decision that you need to make. And you may feel it's not going to make a difference, but it really does make a difference. Because when you sit down with your children and you tell them, I did not invest in these companies. And, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, mashallah, Muslim families, we have like four kids, you know, then when your kids become, inshallah, you know, become engineers, doctors, or, you know, whatever, they're also not going to do that. You know, and then they're going, and then they're going to have kids. They're going to have friends. They're going to go to school. They're going to, you know, convey that to them. So, it's a long road ahead, but it really starts with you making that first conscious decision. Like, and we have some questions online that I'll um, get to right now. So um, I'm going to combine these two qu these uh, this question together. It's uh, from a student who goes to a public school. I'd like to hear your perspective on how to navigate pushing administrations to speak about issues revolving around doxing and harassment of Muslim students surrounding the Palestine issue. And then also from a parent who has a child in a, a public school, are schools district informed schools to talk about the subject during the classes if teachers feel necessary? What should we tell students to say if students are asked to share their opinions? Um, I, I don't know too much about this other than to uh, remind everyone that uh, so doxing is obviously a form of bullying uh, and cyberbullying, and um, CARE has made that one of its uh, priorities to address that, especially affecting Muslim students. Um, and so I would, we, I don't, I don't know too much about it, but I know that we have folks at the CARE San Francisco Bay Area office and the CARE Sacramento office and, you know, all, all over CARE California that are dedicated to addressing these issues of, of bullying for any Muslim student for any reason, um, but, um, you know, in, including if they're being uh, bullied over their perspectives or their opinions in regards to Palestine. Um, so... And the parents should be empowered also to speak up, speak up on these issues. And that, that, that's part of the whole reason about educating and, and speaking out, because it's easier to be bullied and to, and to be silent when um, we're not familiar with, you know, what's out there and the different ways that we can we can address it. There, there, there is a uh, 
there, there are talking points that it's important to just like have down for students and for parents. That was the session that was being conducted in the other room. I don't think it was live stream, but perhaps if there's like a way we can post that list um, when you're by somewhere on like the MCC website, it's like a document that one can you know download and um, and uh, and and just use for talking points. So five, ten different talking points about what you should say how you should respond to certain type of comments um, that are very based in like facts and history uh, and, and will help you, um, will be very useful when it comes to conversations at the school yeah, and at work. Yeah, so um, for those that are watching online, in addition to the, those that are here in person, in the video description of today's event on the live stream, we'll have it in the description, both the template that you could use from Sidi Osama, that you could use uh, to talk to your employer, to send to your HR, and then for the parents as well, uh, to share with your youth the talking points that we've shared with, with the teenagers in the conference room today. Yeah, I also there's a Care California has a toolkit for discussing Palestine in the in the workplace in the school that'll be in the description as well. Perfect. Yeah, it's almost. We can wrap. Yeah. Okay, we can wrap up, inshallah. Just a reminder, also, uh, the kids are still inside the uh, with Sidi Mahdi, but we do have uh, pizza and snacks in the banquet hall for everybody after we finish both sessions. Jazakallah khair. Go ahead. Beautiful. Jazakallah khair. So, yeah, barakallah fikum again, everybody, for, uh, you know, coming coming today. And it's it's an ongoing discussion, especially the practical aspect of, of how to do it. It's something you got to keep. That's what community is for. That's one of the you know roles of communities that we you know talk to each other about it. We have different perspectives, we have different situations, and we kind of figure out how to do it. But the most important thing is that we're intentional about it and that we you know put our sincere effort um, to doing something. So, jazakumullah uh, khair to our brother Sama and to Sishara for for coming. Really appreciate it. And uh, I think Sishara will end us with some dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin fil awaleen wa salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin fil akhireen wa salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin fil malil ala ala yawmiddin. Rabbana atina fil dunya hasanan dhamma fil akhirati hasanan dhamma kinna adhabanna. Rabbana afriq alayna sabran wa thabit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawmi al-kafirin. Rabbana afriq alayna sabran wa thabit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawmi al-kafirin. Rabbana afriq alayna sabran wa thabit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawmi al-kafirin. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Latif, Ya Fattah, Ya Mubin. Ya Qawiyu al-Yamateen, Ikfi Shari al-Zalimeen. Ya Qawiyu al-Yamateen, Ikfi Shari al-Zalimeen. Ya Qawiyu al-Yamateen, Ikfi Shari al-Zalimeen. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we turn to you, Ya Allah. We beseech you by your mercy, Ya Allah. We beseech you by your Rahmah and by your Lutf, Ya Allah. We ask, Ya Allah, that you completely, completely, completely give assistance to our brothers and sisters and the children in Philistine, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Encompass them in your mercy, Ya Rahman, Ya Hafid, Ya Hafid. Protect all of them, Ya Allah. Protect all of them. Protect all of those whose homes are being destroyed. Protect all of those whose lives are being targeted, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Protect all of those who are just standing there with, with just living their life and then they are being targeted and they're being harmed and that they're being and killed, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you bestow your special protection around Gaza and around Palestine and, and, all, and around the West Bank, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you treat the people of Palestine whom your Messenger Sallallahu has said are special people, Ya Allah. Treat them with the best of protections, Ya Allah, and the best of Rahmah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, for all of those who have passed away, Ya Allah, all of those who have passed away, Ya Arham Rahimeen, Ya Allah, amongst the Mu'mineen, Ya Allah. Elevate them to the highest station of Shuhada, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Give them the highest of stations of Jannah with your Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Sallam, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, there are so many many, Ya Allah, who have lost their children, who have lost their parents, or who have lost their siblings, or their cousins, or their aunts, or their uncles, Ya Allah, and they're going through their lives, Ya Allah, having tawakkul in you, and having sabr, Ya Allah, but who are extremely, extremely saddened by the difficulties, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, we beseech you for your help, Ya Allah, help all of those, Ya Allah, who are struggling, Ya Allah, help all of those who are struggling, Ya Allah, help all of those who are struggling, Ya Arham Rahimin, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, all the children that are getting harmed, who no longer have their parents to take care of them, Ya Allah, we ask that you take care of them, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, all of those parents who have lost their children, Ya Allah, and who are struggling immensely, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, with this immense, immense, immense tribulation, Ya Allah, we ask that you give them strength and that you give them sabr and that you give them himma, Ya Arham Rahimin, Ya Allah, we ask that you end this evil occupation, Ya Rabbil Alameen, this satanic occupation that has been taking place for so long against our brothers and sisters. We ask that you completely remove the occupiers and that you destroy every single one of their intentions to harm innocent Muslims, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Qahar, Ya Qahar, Ya Qahar, Ya Allah, we beseech you for your help. 
and for your aid. Ya Allah, we have you. We have no one else to turn to except you. We, ex we, we express our brokenness before you. Ya Allah, we are weak. We have no ability, but we have your ability. Ya Allah, we have no strength on our own, but we have your strength. Ya Allah, we have no power, but we have your power. Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, we ask that you help our brothers and sisters. Ya Allah, make their feet firm. Point that pour sabr into their hearts, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and give them victory over these oppressors, Ya Allah, and allow these oppressors to leave them, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, and return Philistine to the, to, to the Palestinians, Ya Arham Rahimin. We ask for your immense assistance in these difficult times, Ya Allah, for all of those Muslims around the world who are that feeling feeling so much trouble over this, Ya Allah, give them inspiration and understanding to turn to you and to beseech you, Ya Allah, you are the one who can help in this situation, Ya Allah, whatever we do, whatever we say, only comes after your help, Ya Allah, so give us strength and give us the ability to turn to you, Ya Arham Rahimin, in dua and in dhikr and in salat and in prayer, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, and whatever other actions that we can take, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, give us all courage and understanding, protect the Muslim generality around the world, Ya Allah, protect the Muslims in this country, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, protect them from any form of harm Ya Arham Rahimin, Ya Hafid, Ya Hafid Ya Hafid, we ask you Ya Allah for your comprehensive goodness and your comprehensive guidance as we try to process all of these things Ya Allah and we ask that you lift the siege Ya Razak, Ya Allah provide them water Ya Allah provide them water, Ya Allah provide them water Ya Allah they don't even have enough water Ya Allah to drink or to wash or to do any of their basic acts Ya Allah and we are standing still living in luxury and we don't even realize our blessings many times Ya Allah provide all of our Palestinian brothers and sisters with their necessities and much more, Ya Allah, give them water and give them food, Ya Allah, and give them electricity and give them homes, Ya Allah, and give them help, Ya Allah, they have been living under difficulty and tribulation for decades, Ya Allah, we ask for your mercy, Ya Allah, you, you have said that your help is near, we ask that you show them your help and that you show them your aid and that you assist them and give them high, 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 high ranks for all of the suburb that they have endured, Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you, Ya Allah that you allow us to be people of shukr and that you allow us to be people of worship and people of service towards you, Ya Allah, and that you allow us to spend our life, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in the best ways to try and serve your ummah as so many Muslims around the world have so le so much less than we do and they're spending their life in service of you in whatever way they're able to. We ask that you allow us to use our blessings and our ability and our voices and our capabilities and whatever uh, blessings we have been given, Ya Allah, in service of you and in the service of the ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask that you give the ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Victory, Ya Allah. Allahumma faraj ummati Sayyidina Muhammad and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma arham ummati Sayyidina Muhammad and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, give mercy and give relief to this ummah all around the world and give this ummah victory like you promised your blessed messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, give this ummah victory around the world. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask for your comprehensive goodness that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for and we ask you for protection from everything evil that he has protection from. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barik ala khayri khalqi Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And we'll do a Fatiha collectively for all those souls who have passed away at Fatiha.